today's devotional is called Clear Version. You shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. That's Isaiah 55 12. Several years ago, after returning from my evening walk, I composed these words for my journal. I saw a tree today, straight and tall, rooted in the clay. Its branches spread beneath the sky, praising God, and so shall I. When I walk the path, I often think when I recite these words. Recently, I had cataract surgery in both eyes. The change to my vision had been gradual, and I had not realized how blurred it had become. Now I am once again able to see the magnificent beauty of the tree that inspired me to write these words. Reflecting on this change, I realized that in the same way that my vision gradually changed, my spiritual vision can also become blurred. But just just as I finally decided to have my eyes examined and successfully treated, so too does my spiritual vision need continued uh, treatment. With the Holy Spirit's guidance, and as I join with fellow believers in worship, prayer, and Bible study, my spiritual vision will stay focused on God's love and grace, and I will clearly see the redeeming love of Christ. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for your gift of Christ Jesus and for the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Amen. 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 Wayne? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Tyson, the United Methodist Minister in North Carolina Conference, who always taught me to listen to folks with one ear and to the Lord with the other. <laughs> all the time. And I just heard over there that someone here was really struggling of the dark night of the soul. It was really carrying a burden or two here. So I'm not going to ask you who it is, but let's just close our eyes and pray for that person, okay? Father, we, we lift up our brother or our sister who this morning is really, really needs you. We want to thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Apart from you, there is no other. We are the Lord God who created the ends of the earth. And apart from you, there is no succor, succor or, or help on this earth. We want to thank you, in Jesus' name, that you are tending to the, to the burden of our brother or our sister. And we ask that you complete their joy and show them the way, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I... Uh, I was just thinking, you know, um, Sissy is such a polished teacher. She, uh, she gives us polished presentations. And I just compare myself to her by, by saying that I'm herky-jerky. <laughs> I'm, I'm herky-jerky because, because I find better that if you have a few curves in the road, people uh, pay more attention to the road. <laughs> and so I'm going to be a little bit of herky jerky this morning. And we're going to focus on the Apostle Paul, not the Apostle, well, uh, on the uh, Abraham, uh, the patriarch Abraham, who was the father of all who have faith, according to the Apostle Paul. And we're going to read about. Uh, 
some of the things that Paul said about Abraham, some of the things that the book of Hebrews says about Abraham. But first of all, I want to get you to answer a question. What was Abraham's hometown? Uh, uh, Spell that. You are. You are. <laughs> You're close, but that's not it. Ur, Ur of Chaldea is a country. Okay? Yes. Now, who's going to look at the end of chapter 11 of Genesis, the last verse or two, and tell me where he's from? <clears throat> Somebody open your Bible and tell me where he's from. From Ur of the Chaldees, go to Canaan. Keep reading. Oh. Haran. Haran, yeah. Haran. Yeah, he's from Haran. And uh, what what does Abraham do that's different than most people? He moved from Ur to Haran. And then he went from Haran to Canaan. How many of you moved to Jacksonville from somewhere else? Raise your hands. Uh, how many of you researched Jacksonville before you got here? You looked through uh, maps, or you looked through, or you read, tried to read as much as you could about it? And, like, huh? You mean you just came here sight and see? Sure. Mm -hmm. Huh? Well, back in those days, there was no police. There were no police. Back in those days, there were uh, very few cities. Back in those days, everything was livestock um, and servants, um, male and female servants, and families. And so the Bible says that Abraham was called to go into this country, verse uh, 1 of uh, Genesis. Let's turn to chapter 12 of the verse of uh, Genesis and take a look at this because. Uh, I think when we take a look at this with Genesis, we'll, we'll discover some, some things for us to grow toward. I told you I was hurting Jerry. Chapter 12, verse 1. The call of Abraham. The Lord said to Abram, A-B-R-A-M, leave your country, what if he told you leave the United States? Huh? Now this, it gets even better than that. Listen to this. Leave your country, your people, and your father's household. Say goodbye to mama. <laughs> Farewell to brothers and sisters. And go to a land that I will show you. Where am I going, Lord? When you get there, I'll show it to you. <laughs> now, think about that. And just take a look at just a couple of verses here following that. And go to the land I will show you, verse 2. And I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And then in verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I what? To your offspring, I shall what? Bless. No, your, to your offspring, I shall what? Make a mighty nation. Make a mighty nation. So he not a, what 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 did God promise Abraham? Abraham did. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about a promise in just a minute. What a promise it is. But he promised him first of all a people. Then he promised him a land and a nation. All the land that you see, I will give unto you. And. Uh, he promised him that he would be a blessing to his people. And so here we have a whole bunch of things right here couched in one or two or three or four or five verses that should give us great uh, encouragement to walk by faith. 
Because what happened to Abraham when he heard God say this word? What did he do? He gathered up his livestock. He gathered up his servants. He said goodbye to mama and daddy. He didn't know when he'd see them again. And by the way, what was his daddy's name? <laughs> I told him, Berkey Turkey. What was his daddy? His daddy's name was Terah, T-E-R-A-H. And you could almost just remember the word Terah, T-E-R-R-O-R. <laughs> but Terah, uh, uh, and uh, Terah, and uh, so and he promised Abraham all these things, and Abraham believed the Lord. <clears throat> these were all promises. 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 And so it's very, very important that we learn early on that when the Word of God gives us a promise, we're to receive it. It wouldn't hurt you to say, I just read that. Did I read that right? I received that word. <laughs> That's a promise. Um, and let's, let's take a look at one of the promises that resulted. Uh, turn to Romans 4, because Romans 4 is um, a great chapter and um, it's all about Abraham and we want to pick up hey Pat how you doing good to see you verse 18 by the way I picked up the wrong glasses this morning how many of you have ever done that before? <laughs> Pick up the ones you discarded rather than the ones that you're using. It's so easy because they look just alike. And it's so easy just to pick them up. So this, these, are, these are quite old and you can see the scratches and everything on them. And so, verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact, this is regard to Isaac, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Uh, how many of you have ever had a child at a hundred? <laughs> I'd run from that critter if I did. <laughs> if you wanted, I'm not too sure about these children born at a hundred, but uh, at any rate, <clears throat> verse 20, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding what? The promise of God. He did not waver. Now, here we come to the character of a promise. By the way, I don't deal with genealogies. <laughs> I've got a family genealogy that runs back to the 1500s, but I don't deal with these genealogies because I've never had them go anywhere. <laughs> so, I mean, well, I'm going to skip the genealogy and talk about Abraham. And um, so, um, I've, got to, I've got to learn to reel in all these fishing lines on that out. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? How I many of you let up three or four fishing lines when you're talking? You forget which one you're on. <laughs> um, he he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what He had promised. 
see how important a promise is. Now, a promise is a bird in the bush. You don't have that promise in your hand except by your faith. But when God speaks to you, how many of you have had the Lord say something to you? Uh, through the scriptures or through something, you knew it was the Lord who spoke to you, who gave you direction. Uh, well, it's, it's important that we understand that that's a bird in the bush. And the Lord is going to, going to uh, um, he, he's going to, he's the only one that can do it. So you got to hold on to the promise, just as Abraham did, who was promised, what was he promised? Not only land, but a son, wasn't he? And he held on until that promise came through. Over and over again, he went back to God and said, Hey, God, why are you so slow? God said, well, he says, uh, maybe you've got 80 years here, but I've got generations. <laughs> and so we, 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 we always want everything to come true immediately, don't we? But that, you don't need faith for that, do you? <laughs> and um, I'll tell you a little personal story because I want you to understand the character of a promise. Um, my life was changed um, in a major way in 19, late 1970s by something I kept hearing. Or I used to get up and I'd read the Bible for a couple hours every morning before I'd go to work at the office. And um, then I'd pray. And as I prayed, I always made a note of what I seemed to hear. So one day the Lord began to say to me, I'm going to make you an apostle to the nations. I'm going to make you an apostle to the nations. I said, what? What? First of all, apostle, there were 12. They're not 1,500. There were 12. Well, I soon learned that there were 70 later. And then apostle truly means just one who is sent. In its, in its true form, it just means one who God sends to the nations. Well, I hadn't thought about that when I loved languages so much in college. But I was a French, German, and Spanish major in college. I loved, I couldn't explain why I loved languages. And here was a little boy who had grown up with a laborer as a daddy. And here I was in love with foreign languages. <laughs> why am I in love with foreign languages? Well, later on, when I got into the, 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 what the Lutherans call parish ministry, because until, I'll, I'll explain things later, but. But um, I uh, heard those words. I said, shut up, I don't want to hear it. I've got a congregation here of, of, of a number of people, and I can't just let it go. And um, I'm not going to. So just shut up. So I, but, so I kept on with my discipline. And the Lord kept on saying, well, I've, uh, I've called, I'm, I want you, you're going to become a, an apostle to the nations. And um, I kept saying, shut up, shut up. I don't want to hear it. I got no way of making that happen. I got no way of making that happen. So just shut up. Now, that's pretty audacious to tell the Lord, shut up, right? Uh, so, but I was frustrated. Here I was getting a message that I didn't understand how in the world I could ever do. So, <clears throat> so at any rate, I got a phone call. Um, I used to be part of a, uh, a thing called Lutheran's Renewal, 
Lutherans renewed, and they met every year in Minneapolis. And the, the head of that convention, where 15,000 people <coughs> gathered every, every summer, called me up and he said, <coughs> Wayne, he said, you have been helping um, uh, the music director at this conference. And I'm going to show you how preposterous this whole thing was on a log logical level. I said, that's right, I held his books. But if you know me at all, you know I can't sing lick. And you don't want me to sing in church. I get everybody else off. <laughs> and so I can't sing a lick. And he said, well, he said, this year he can't make it. And since you know exactly what to do, because you've been helping him all these years, he, he has recommended that I ask you to, to, lead, to lead the worship. All of a sudden, something in me said, I'll do it. And I hung the phone up and I started trembling. I said, I just agreed to do something I can't do. <laughs> I just agreed to do something I can't do. But I had the director of the Handel Oratorio Society in my church, and he was my choir master. And he was sensational. So I said, Don, Come with me. I need you for three days. <laughs> so he led the worship. He was sensational. While well, I held his books. <laughs> and uh, but at the end of it, um, all the leaders were supposed to welcome dignitaries from foreign nations, from other lands. Well, the first person up, and they put me up there too, was an Indian bishop. He said, Pastor Wood, can you come to India and speak to my pastors? I said, um, let's have lunch together. <laughs> now, we can talk some more about this. The second person up was a French pastor. So I, just to be nice, I started speaking to him a little in French. And he said, I can't believe this, an American who speaks French. Would you come and speak to my pastors over here? He said, I, I lead a group of about 50 pastors, and we, we're, we're going to have a, a conference in, in uh, November. Would you come and speak to them? And I said, let's have lunch together. So I sat there together with the bishop and this French pastor, and I watched God do it. There were, I promise you, I didn't do a thing to help. But God fulfilled His promise. And for 20 to 25 years, I traveled in Europe speaking to congregations, teaching pastors. And so I've had a, quite a career. And I began to realize that that really was my calling. But God had to put some things in place before I could exercise it. I had to love those languages, see? Listen, I played football in college. And all those, all those linemen were saying, Wood, you study languages? Oh, they were trying to avoid them. <laughs> I said, yeah. And they were just, they were wonderful to me. I just loved language. I couldn't get enough of them. Ich spreche Deutsch, hablo Espanol, ich parle Francais. Warum nicht? Why not? Oui, ich parle Francais. And so, and so it's just it's just natural for me to do that. Now, you know, if you get a promise from God, you can't run from it. Especially if God keeps hammering it into your spirit. Really listen to those things because he's going to shape your life that way. He shaped Abraham's life by a promise. And God will shape our life by a promise. If you read the scriptures, you're going to get a promise. Because you see, the scriptures teach us how to hear from God. 
this this is I don't know if you've ever heard it said this way or not. This is the most revolutionary book that's ever been written. There never has been a book written like this. It's a revolution. It's not an evolution, it's a revolution. Because it teaches you to walk by faith and not by sight. Well, something, I don't, I don't know what time it is, but, but I'm, I'm going to keep going just, just for time's sake. <laughs> but I wanted you to understand the character of a promise. You do not have that promise in your hand. It is a bird in the bush. And you keep praying and you keep praying and you watch God fulfill His Word through that promise. He still speaks to people. In fact, that's, that's, that's what He wants to do. That's His primary purpose. To speak to us and give us guidance. Um, anybody can do a program. But who can do God's program? There's a difference between a good work and a God work. Yes. How many of you know that? Anybody had a God experience like that? Would you like to share it, buddy? But I was a very young, okay, I, I, I was a, a young widow mother with a two-year-old. Mm -hmm. And I was living in Miami, Florida, and, and of course I'm a little girl from South Carolina, and everybody, my grandmother, my mother, you need to come home. And I knew if I went home, Cindy would be my little sister, and then I'll just take care of me. Yeah. And I prayed and prayed and prayed, and God said, don't go. Stay here where you have no family. And yet, I will make it. And I said, well, I will be the best mother I can be. And y'all, poor little Cindy never went anywhere that her mother wasn't standing there. You know, I was her Sunday school teacher. I was a vacation Bible school teacher. I, I was the lunch monitor at Millwee Middle School. I was her Girl Scout leader. But I, she, you know, I... I All this is true. And God made me, you know, we had a very good life. And I was her mother. And... I worked very hard to be a good mother. Today she says, um, one of my best phone calls I ever got was when she had little Kimberly, was a, 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 a little, like not two, just a little thing. And I was working in Minnesota at the time and she called me up and she said, Mama, I've been thinking about you and I know I always laugh at you and say, um, you're too friendly, you're too, you're, all the things you are. She said, but I just realized if I could be half the mother to Kimberly that you have been to me, my life will be a success. So God made a promise to me and he kept it. So that's my story. <laughs> Thank you. And I don't think I've ever told people that before. Now, how many other you know, stories, many? honey, do you think are in this room. Uh, everybody, I'm sure. Everybody has a story. Anybody else want to share a story of how God has shaped her life? Okay. Help me remember your name. Suzanne. 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 Okay. Um, Suzanne? Actually, I like to think that God has shaped my life all along in my life, but I think in this last year, God has shaped my life more than anything else. Um, I believe God is good. I believe in the power of prayer. Um, and all those have just come full circle this past week. I did go Thursday and Friday, which most of you know, back down to Moffitt Cancer Center. And um, I've got a good report. He said there's little to no growth yes. in the cancer. And um, he looks at me and he looks at the x ray and he was talking. And he just said, "I This is. You know, amazing. There's just a little or no growth, and I go, no, I expected that. <laughs> and uh, I firmly, and I said, I firmly believe in the power of prayer. And if I've ever had prayers and love that has been shared for me, it's been, 
you know, overwhelming to me and the most humbling thing. And I think God had to put me through this to see the whole picture. Mm -hmm. And he gave me such peace of mind during the whole thing that I would have never thought I had. And from the very beginning, I've had amazing peace about the whole thing. So, um, so I don't have to go back to Moffitt for six months. And uh, then he's going to talk about doing something with the liver. And, uh, but he said there's just been very little growth in, uh, or none in some of the areas. So um, we're, that's, a, that's the best news we could have, except that it was gone. And I expected him to go in there and say, where is it? Uh, that's next time. That's next time. That's next time. But it, it truly is the power of prayer. See, when we begin to, to talk, we begin to see there are a lot of God stories out there. Anybody else would have one that would like to share a little love? We don't have to share everything, but just, it's, it's so heartening and encouraging when people share their life experiences in, in the form of, of, of promise and, and what God is doing in their lives. I promise you this, Elaine and I are not here out of our natural choice. God has put us here. And uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I want to leave Jacksonville because I'm a mountain boy. <laughs> and every time I want to, I always talk a little bit with the Lord about that. He says, nope. <laughs> he says, I'll have you where I want you. So that's where I'm happy. <laughs> Anybody else have stories like that? Wow. See, I'm not, I'm not the only one that's got stories oh, like I've that. I've told mine too plenty of times. Yeah. I, had, I had three calls, oh, yeah. and I answered all of them. And they changed my life. And I've told you all these stories. But the first one was I was on my way to uh, up north with a scholarship to get a master's degree and had everything all planned. And I got a phone call from a man named Dr. Harden, who was the principal at John Gorey uh, Junior High School. And he said, I heard you have an English degree, and I really need an English teacher. And I didn't know him, and I knew he didn't know me. And I said, how did you get my name? He says, well, somebody told me that you were available to teach. And he said, all I want you to do is come over and talk to me. And so I said, OK. At the time, I was sitting around a swimming pool, you know, talking about my trip uh, to the north, to California. Living a good life. And went over and sat down and talked to Mr. Harden. And before I left, I had signed a contract to teach English at John Gorey. Uh, the the long-term result of that is that I was dating this young man named Richard Moore, and I had already told him I'm leaving town. And he said, I wish you wouldn't go. <laughs> I didn't go, and eventually, a year later, we were married, and that, of course, changed my whole life. But it was, has been a wonderful journey uh, in, in the last 55 years. That was first call. Second call was um, I was uh, very happy, uh, retired from my first job, and decided I'd go home and. Uh, you know, write or do something creative. And I got another call, and it was from Dr. Davy Parrish. And I didn't know Davy at the time, but she said, I have a, um, you know, a, a nonprofit in Springfield called The Bridge of Northeast Florida, and we need a teacher badly. I said, we were having, we have young welfare mothers with children, and we have a wonderful program going, but I can't get a a teacher that can communicate with these children, and I would like for you to come. And I, she was very persuasive, and so that was on a Friday afternoon. I was there <coughs> Monday morning, and for the next seven years, <laughs> I was at the bridge with a uh, scholar, with a um, foundational grant to teach a GED to welfare mothers with children. And uh, we had a, that was the most wonderful uh, experience in my life. I love the, the students. I still go in hospitals today, and I miss Margaret. They, you know, they recognize we were we were very really close. We had wonderful relationships, and and I treasure those seven years of that grant. 
Then I came home from there and decided, well, it's uh, probably about time for me to just take it easy. And I got a call that we needed some help in the office at the church. And I got a few things to do there. We need somebody that has a little experience. We're still working on Underwood typewriters and Rolodex. <laughs> And um, I understand you can do something with computers for us. So I said, okay, I'll come spend a few, uh, few weeks there seeing what we can do there. And 14 years later. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they were, you know, th those were important calls in, in my life and they really did make a difference. And I love the years that I spent there. Probably the one that I treasure in a deeper and sweeter place is that uh, somewhere in the middle of all these, I got a call from Jean Darn. And she said, we need to start a new Sunday school class at Southside Methodist. We've got some young married people that uh, don't have a, a, you know, haven't found a place to go to Sunday school. Would you start a class? And I said, no, I'm just now finished all these other things and I'm taking, well, just do it for six weeks and we will develop a teaching team. Now that was 47 years ago. <laughs> and I said, yes, that was, that was a call that I came and I started teaching this class, developing a teaching team, which we have a wonderful teaching team now. And uh, there's always somebody available to do it. But the fellowship has been a treasure not only to me, but I think to everybody here. And uh, we have, uh, it has certainly enhanced and supported my faith through every situation that I have been faced with. And so, thank you, Lord, for calls. Mm -hmm. Well, look at that. How many of you know that we've just had a learning event? <laughs> we've just had a learning event. And I'll bet there's one more person who can contribute to this. I bet Janice. Janice has some things. She, she's had an experience I guarantee you she, want, she needs to share. Okay, not today. Not They're today. Gonna share, <laughs> you're gonna share it today? You're gonna make me look bad, Janice. I'm gonna tell you about that. Another day. Another day. It's a long story. I'm not oh, going okay. to get drunker. We're doing another day. Okay, all righty. All righty. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll close with just a few words of scripture here. Abraham says, or the book of Hebrews says in chapter 11, 10, we look forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. I don't know about you, but that really, that really just gets me. We look forward to a city that is not made with human hands, eternal in the heavens. If we were looking for a better country, Hebrews says, a heavenly one, oh, it means, it means uh, our forefathers were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. And therefore, God is not ashamed to call them, to call them um, his children, for he has prepared a plate, a city, for them. God is not ashamed to call those faithful ones his children, because he has made a city for them. And then in Hebrews 11, 38, uh, recognizing that there's been a lot of suffering done by, by Christians over the years, over the centuries, it says the world was not worthy of them. The world was not worthy of them. So is faith easy? You learn to walk with the bird in your hand, uh, with the bird in the bush, <coughs> being sure that that's going to become a, a bird in your hand. Now when you are able to simply understand and receive that what God promised me is not there right now, but it will be in God's own time. Latch on to it and never let it go, and God's going to change your life by it. 
that's the way he works. Amen. Well, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we want to thank you in Jesus' name for your very great promises. <clears throat> We're, I'm so happy that you understand your promises and that you make your promises too. And you want to make each one of us promise, either through the scriptures that we read or direct your, uh, to our spirits. And Lord, we pray that you speak to every one of us here. Give us the certainty and the confidence we need to walk every day unashamedly in the grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. on Betty. Susie, do you want to give us an update on Betty? Well, um, I, we've been texting back and forth. Betty's home. She came home Friday afternoon from Mayo. I guess most of you knew she'd been in there for a good week. Anyway, um, she had, they had to rebuild the bottom of her because the infection, um, and she's got a little paralysis, but it was draining a good bit, and they were going to put tubes in here, and the nurses were going to come three times a day to relieve it. But yesterday, the last I heard was that, you know, I've got it on my phone. Can I read it to you? Yeah, sure. sure. Mm -hmm. That might be best. Um, she, um, she just needs rest for sure. Uh, and lots of it. Okay. Okay. She says here. I'm home as for last night, which was Friday night. Still on antibiotics, just not I think so. She's apparently she didn't have to have that. Long needed um, long term rest. Can now have some soft foods and not just clear liquids. That's what she's been on. Mm -hmm. Or just clear liquids. Glad you I think that's about me. <coughs> weeks of rest in healing before I will get back in the swing of things and I am restored. Now that is good news. There was paralysis honestly I have not um, talked to her about that in the last few days but she had paralysis. Um, it was it was very serious. Mm -hmm. So we need to keep Betty in our serious. prayers. Right. And it's supposed to improve for the next three to six months. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Susie. Sorry. We'll Thanks. keep Betty in our prayers. On a happier note, we did get an email from Tom Vogel, who's back from Fiji. Uh -huh. And um, uh, he said, the power is restored, lots of debris, but no structural damage around here. Apparently being on the west side of the storm circulation is the best place to be. We dodged a bullet this time, but I sure feel bad for those not so fortunate. Looking forward to being back in class the first week of November. Oh, very good. Oh, okay. okay. Um, also, in the um, newspaper, there was a very nice article about Mason, and Tom reported that the Sunday school here has already purchased the preschool Bibles, and um, they have them and they're using them um, that we donated. So that's nice. And um, I also, I was supposed to hand out our new directory today. However, 
I uh, was uh, really challenged. I have all the data put together, and I was making it into a booklet like this, okay? Well, if anybody has ever put together a booklet, a two-sided booklet, I think, I went to bed last night, and I think I know how now to do it after several hours of trying. So um, if anybody has expertise in this department, talk to me, please. Um, are there any other announcements? How about Bill Hayward? Um, I haven't heard any more. Let's, he's home, and he has um, he had a cut on his foot, and I think it's called encephalite, um, encephalitis, something like that. But that's what it was. Got into his bloodstream, and that's what was causing it. But he has to have antibodies every three hours, and he's doing well. So we need a week. Oh my. Okay. We need to keep. Okay. So we need to keep Bill in our prayers too. Any other announcements? Andy, it's nice to have you back at the piano. <laughs> we were dealing with some storms too. Oh, really? Yeah. Georgia got hit pretty bad too. And uh, our old town, the town I was born in, Mariana, Florida, took, took down the front. Lafayette Street there down too. We haven't heard about all that yet. Mm -hmm. You know, they're focusing on Mexico Beach yeah. and Panama City. But that went right up through the country there. That's, that's where I'm from. And they'll live there for a while, too. But it's, it's pretty rough in there. Very rough. Well, we have a lot to pray about and a lot to be thankful for. Amen. Yes, you do. Anything else? Hi, Jim. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. That was a wonderful lesson. It yes. was. I think mean, you, you're probably going to get some job offers. So. <laughs> <laughs> and Jasmine, it's wonderful to have our technical department just, back. Just, Yay. <laughs> just don't make me study another language. to death. The second woman says, how horrible. First woman, it wasn't so bad. After I quit shaking from the cold, I began to get warm and sleepy and finally died at a peaceful death. What about you? The second woman, I died a massive heart attack. I suspected that my husband was cheating, so I came home early to catch him in the act but instead I found him all by himself in the den watching TV. First woman, so what happened? Second woman says, I was so sure there was another woman here somewhere that I started running all over the house looking. I ran up into the attic, searched and down into the basement. Then I went through every closet and checked under all the beds. I kept this up until I had looked everywhere, and finally I became so exhausted, I just keeled over with a heart attack and died. Oh. First woman, too bad you didn't look under the freezer. We'd both still be alive. <laughs> Words in my mouth and the meditations in my heart 
Be accepted, Lord, my Son.